Sure. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We're very thankful for the opportunity that we have to gain knowledge by study and by faith. And we ask that thy spirit may be with us here, that uh, Mr. Gentile may be able to um, present the ideas and the things that he, ha that he knows, that he may share it with us, and that we can know by thy spirit the, the truth in, in the history of, of our country and of this world. We love you so much and say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, well, so today we have an introduction to the Industrial Revolution. Um, and, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution just had so many effects on the world uh, that I, I, think, I think it will be really amazing for us to try to just peel away the layers um, of our own lives to see where so much of, of our daily experience comes from, uh, which is this Industrial Revolution. And so today we're going to talk about the early phases of this Industrial Revolution. So we have a few case studies here that, that I think will just help to drive home the point of, of, of the nature of these changes. So first let's research. Uh, so student versus calculator, student versus hole puncher, and student versus stapler. Who wins and why? Well, the <laughs> the uh, the items win in the in the category that they're good for, I guess. <laughs> sure, sure, but certainly they have their limitations, right? Right. Definitely. So, for example, you know, if if I ask uh, a calculator, okay, you know, uh, paint me a masterpiece, write a symphony. Well, that would be very different. But perhaps if I ask the student, I could get uh, a great piece of art or uh, a beautiful piece of music. But at the same time, if I said uh, you know, what is the square root of 3,963.8, you know, to the, the nearest, you know, 10,000th, well, I think the calculator might win, <laughs> definitely, just as you said, Wendy. Uh, certainly the hole puncher, uh, you know, if, if, I'm at, if, my, if my specific narrow task is to punch evenly spaced, perfectly round holes, well, I think my student might have a difficult time doing it um, with the same speed and accuracy, uh, perhaps, most often uh, as the hole puncher. And then the stapler, well, certainly uh, trying to bind pieces of paper together uh, with a tiny piece of metal is almost like with our fingers, but yet with a little machine, uh, we can do it. And so why would you say that in these narrow instances um, do the calculator, hole puncher, and stapler win? They're just more efficient at that particular task. OK, great. Yeah, definitely more efficient at that task. Well, let's, let's keep looking then. OK, I need to dig a ditch. I can either use a shovel or a backhoe. I need to uh, sew, um, I don't know, a sweater. Do you sew sweaters? <laughs> I need a needle versus a sewing machine. Um, I need to uh, put together, uh, oh, a baby crib with uh, you know, 28 screws to it. Uh, I can either use a screwdriver or a power drill. Uh, of course, what wins and then why? What do we learn about this efficiency? Where does it come from? Well, in this case, the, uh, the, second, the second choice in each of them, the power drill, the sewing machine, these are things that are powered by something other than a man's strength. And mm -hmm. so it becomes even more efficient at getting something done. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, when I was growing up, I used to spend hours and hours and hours on my uncle's farm uh, doing tasks such as move the large boulder from one side of the garden to the other, or dig a trench that is two feet wide and six feet down along 100 yards of fence. Uh, and I would do those things with a shovel or with my own hands or with a wheelbarrow perhaps, um, but uh, there were many times where I certainly wished for a backhoe. Uh, and, and the reason, uh, the power, the power differential is, uh, is why. Well, if we look here, here's, here's, these are a little bit different. Let's look at these case studies. Research, and welcome to Heidi, of course. Um, research, a father carving a wooden horse for his son versus a factory making thousands of plastic horses for children. Spinning and weaving cotton cloth by hand versus making cloth by power looms. Or a daughter in Austria handwriting and mailing a letter to her mother in Brazil versus a boy in America emailing his father in Korea. Compare and contrast. What are the differences? What are the similarities? I 
different well, I think part of what you see is that it takes the personalization out of it. The more technology we get, things become less personalized. Mm -hmm. like yeah. I'd rather have somebody carve me something than one of a million plastic horses. Yeah, definitely. Right. Thank you for and so much. The art of hand of writing a letter anymore is almost forgotten. Mm -hmm. As far as the cloth, I don't know. I still think doing it by the looms. <laughs> right. It's superior, but <laughs> I haven't ever done it by hand, so maybe I changed my mind. Maybe it would be very gratifying. Thank, thank you so much for that. Certainly, right, there is a sentimental, personalized touch that is lost uh, through industrialization. Thank you so much for that. And welcome, Walter. How are you? Good. Good, good to have you again. We're just looking at some case studies, um, trying to understand industrialization. Okay, and then here's, uh, here's the last one. Uh, Elizabeth takes 500 hours to spin one pound of cotton. And, and by the way, uh, this, this was a true figure for spinning a, a pound of cotton um, at the turn of uh, the 19th century. Uh, a power loom can do it in 50 minutes, and that was true by about 1830. Uh, Elizabeth charges $10 an hour for her work. One pound of cotton from a power loom costs $10. What are two advantages of the power loom compared to Elizabeth? I, the power loom uh, produces faster and cheaper cotton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent, right? We have production going way up and cost going way down. Uh, because certainly, uh, think of it, 500 hours times $10 an hour, that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, but yet... <laughs> Right, if you can just spend 10 bucks and get the same thing, um, well, certainly uh, as budgets are tight, we, we start to say, well, is, is the sentimental value really worth the cost? Um, and I'm not saying that it's not necessarily, but I'm saying these are questions that people started to grapple with at the beginning of the 19th century um, as we see machines compete with, with humans. Uh, welcome, Lori. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Oh, good, good. We were just talking about how uh, industrialization uh, increased production um, and decreased cost. Okay. Well, okay. Let's, oh, let's, let's reason that. If, if we look at so from these case studies that, that we've done together today, uh, you know, they all relate to the Industrial Revolution, of course. That's what we're talking about today. Uh, so from those, what would your personal definition be of the Industrial Revolution? A time that I'm glad happened, but I sure wouldn't have wanted to have been the one who lived through it. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you for that. And, and what did happen? How would you uh, define it if you had to give it a definition of the changes that took place, what they were? What well, was the change of manual labor, manual labor to machine labor? Yeah, definitely, right? So from, from man to machine. Uh, and of course, we've seen some some benefits, and we've seen some drawbacks, um, you know, just in the case studies that we've done. So let's see. Any, anybody else want to venture a personal definition? Those are all great elements of a definition of the industrial revolution. Well, and it also was a time where people less people had to uh, be concerned with producing food, mm -hmm. because smaller amounts of people could produce the food that the whole population needed. So more people were available to go into other kinds of jobs than just trying to care for their families with, you know, uh, providing food for them. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that. Um, in fact, uh, my wife and I just, um, uh, on Monday, we, we went to, uh, to see a little farm museum and petting zoo kind of a thing, uh, and there they had a statistic that said that today, 2% um, of the U.S. population produces the food for everybody else. Just 2%. Um, and uh, if you think about that, that is, speaks to exactly what Heidi was talking about with having a few people farm so that everybody else has the freedom to diversify in their uh, field of labor. Well, here, here's, here's one definition, not the only one, of course, but here's one that hits some of the nails on the head. Uh, the Industrial Revolution could be seen as the transformation of the economy, the environment, and living conditions occurring first in England in the 1700s, that resulted from the use of steam engines, the mechanization of manufacturing in factories, and innovation in transportation and communication. So that's what we're going to look at today. 
Okay. Let's, uh, you know, you, you've hopefully been able to do some research from, from those pages. Um, even if you're able to read a couple of them, uh, you'll, you'll get, the, get the drift for sure. Um, but you've done the research, so now let's do some reasoning together. What was the Industrial Revolution in England? How did it look on the ground there? Um, and then, what economic effects did it have? What social effects? What cultural effects? What environmental effects did it have? From your reading, how would you reason? Just a horrible, horrible, horrible time to have had to live through. Anytime there's a, a paradigm shift in a society, you know, the, there, everyone's got to readjust. And, and especially when you're dealing with people who are taking advantage of you, if people aren't Christ-like, uh, mm -hmm. It's just it just leaves this huge black hole for abuse to happen, and it was, ooh, I just I I cringed reading that assignment today. It was just horrible. Yeah, yeah. My my uh, my wife read it last night, and we were we were talking about it, and she had exactly the same reaction. Isn't that right, Christina? Yeah, I kind of give you a crusty for making me read it, but. <laughs> but Wait, what was that? Very, I said you, I gave you kind of a crusty for making me read it, but um, it was very eye opening. Yeah, no, it's it's true, you know, and, and truly, uh, you know, this this is an opportunity. Uh, of course, you know, in history, we have these times where, you know, we can learn what to do, you know, from from great people from the past. Um, at the same time, we also have many opportunities, sadly, where we learn what not to do from other people. Now, of course, uh, it's not quite as sad as learning those same lessons from our own mistakes. So, if we're wise, hopefully, we can learn them from other people. So, just like Wendy was saying. Uh, you know, there's nothing necessarily bad in industrializing, um, but, you know, what about human nature? What about the natural man? Is the natural man being bridled? Is the natural man being pushed down? Is, is Christian virtue rising instead? Are we, are we guarding ourselves against greed, against using power over other people in unhealthy and inappropriate and malicious ways? Uh, you know, these are so many great questions to ask as we see so many good things happening alongside so many tragedies and so many missteps. Uh, I mean, truly, this was such a change, just as Wendy said, that people weren't prepared for, right, paradigm shift, as she said, um, that people really grappled with, okay, how do we come to grips with these changes? How can we try to be a part of them with humanity, with Christ-like attributes? Um, and, you know, some people cared about that, and some people changed what they were doing to be in line with Christ, and then others didn't. Uh, and, we, and we see that too today. So, of course, the choice is always ours when we're given a gift like this. Okay, so if we look at some of these effects then, what would you say? Uh, economic, social, cultural, environmental, what were some of the specific things that you think um, happened as a result of this great change? Well, from the reading, well, initially... Were, it, the machines were replacing the people, and so less people were needed to produce more um, things, and so there was just a, a loss of, of uh, work for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, see, we see, and we'll talk more about this, we see the nature of work shifting. Uh, this will really affect the family in profound ways, uh, as we'll talk about. And so, you know, just as we have lots of unemployment, as, you know, one machine can do the work of 200 men, Suddenly we have lots of people without jobs. Well, some of them can gain jobs back through the new jobs opened up by industrialization. But then you ask yourself, wait, what's the nature of the work they're doing? Uh, and it becomes very different. We see repetition. We see um, mundane um, jobs that, that don't really provide somebody with the satisfaction of seeing the job through its completion. Somebody becomes part of a line of work where their only job is to oversee the machine buttons for the sweaters. They don't get to see the finished sweaters. They don't get to put the buttons on themselves and then present it to their grandchild. Um, but they put the buttons on as they stand in a line for 14 to 16 hours a day. Uh, and yeah, this nature of work um, starts uh, a, new, a new type of life. And of course, because of these ills, we start to see people trying to grapple with them and how to deal with them. And so we see some people turning towards the Christian charity, individual choice, and voluntarily helping one another. We see others saying, no, 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 uh, men won't do it, so let the, let's have the government do it for us. And we see this forced charity. Uh, we see um, communism, socialism, all sorts of other isms to try to combat these, these negative effects. Uh, so what about uh, economic? 
What economic uh, effects did it have? Well, the reading didn't really cover the rich getting richer, but I'm assuming, I'm assuming that happened. But we mostly saw a lot of the poor getting poorer. Sure. We, we see this, this great divide, right, because in order to start a factory, which is what you need to industrialize and, you know, make, make the money that comes from increased production and decreased cost, in order to do that, you have to have capital. You have to have money up front. You have to have some sort of an overhead. Um, and it's hard to get enough to start your own factory. So you see a lot of people with industrialization who start to become stuck unless other people help them out. Um, and so we see this great divide where those who have end up having a lot more, and those who have little end up having a lot less. So we see this great divide, and people come up with all sorts of uh, worldly ideas about how to combat that divide. Uh, others, though, turn to the gospel and combat it in righteous ways uh, as well, of course. But it is a question that people have to deal with. Okay, what about uh, effects on the environment? What would you say? Well, definitely the uh, conditions of the factories inside were terrible, and there was a lot in the reading about people with deformities from having to stand a certain way and work a certain way, and a lot of them had breathing problems. And then you also have uh, what, what, what the reading didn't cover, but I'd imagine a lot more smoke in the air, a lot more pollution from these factories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, right? So we start to see the face of the land change uh, from an agricultural landscape to an industrialized landscape, to an urbanized landscape. Um, and so, yeah, life changes. Uh, the way the world looks changes profoundly. Of course, we talked about the social effects. And, uh, culturally, though, uh, how would this affect life culturally? What kind of culture comes out of uh, industrialization? I'm having a hard time separating social effects from cultural effects, so maybe I'm answering the wrong question. but. Um, a lot of uh, walls were broken down bet between the sexes. It, it exposed young girls to single men at an age that they considered inappropriate. It exposed them even to naked men in, in the mine. Um, and it, it meant less family time, less time with your parents, no, no time for education and religion, with children working 10-hour days. Is that cultural or social? I'm not sure. Well, definitely there's some social implications, but definitely a lot of cultural. So you know, that's a fantastic answer, right? I mean, we, we see um, a culture that revolves around making money because you can make so much money so quickly if, right, you are an industrial capitalist. Uh, Though, because the nature of life changes, all these other people, right, the home farms, the home, the putting out systems and the cottage industries, right, start to fall. And so there's no more family work at home, and so people are driven away from home to work in these factories. And so they get so much less time with each other. Uh, and really, the purposes of life start to shift from a family-centered, a God-centered existence to one where, hey, I have to play the game to try to work my way up the corporate ladder, uh, if possible. Um, if not, I have to be away from my family and away from education. Uh, I have little time um, to certainly consider the finer things of life and to consider God um, because I'm working, you know, 14, 16, 18 hour days um, in this very, very new situation. This changed everything, and, and you just you can't understate it. So well, let's look a little bit more specifically. If you think about the Industrial Revolution, then, and we relate these things, because, I mean, these things are with us. They're with us today, uh, the good and the bad. Um, you know, how do you think the Industrial Revolution re affects your life today? Uh, and, of course, as part of uh, the way it affects it, how does the Industrial Revolution relate to the plan of salvation? Well, to answer the first question, I just think about what I did just today. Um, I use I microwave to cook many, like many of the things that I had. I drove a car to a grocery store where there was food packaged and ready by factories, most likely machines. Um, I'm using the computer now. All of these things kind of came forth from this rise in technology. So just everything we do um, stems from this now today. The way we do things. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Right. I mean. I'm not sure how many of you are sitting at a handcrafted chair that your grandpa made 
Uh, I'm certainly not. Uh, everyone at American Heritage has the same chair. Uh, now, it's a beautiful chair. It's a comfortable chair. It's uh, ergonomically designed to help your back. Um, but um, certainly, right, there's something that's lost in, in this mass production, making everybody the same uh, in some ways. Uh, well, okay, what about the plan of salvation? Because you do need to look at when the Industrial Revolution happened, um, when the advances in communication and transportation happened, um, and the coming forth of the restored gospel. How, how does this relate to the plan of salvation? Well, I can't help but think of how they've stressed so much in our stake the indexing mm -hmm. and trying to get all of the names that are in the vault in Salt Lake onto the computer and just to get the temple work done. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, and I've heard some people say, you know, that they really feel like the, that the invention of the Internet was, was done specifically so that we could do temple work. I don't know if I totally agree with that 100%, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Sure, right. Helps, you know, move the work forward in amazing ways. Definitely. Thank you for that. Uh, what, what else would you say? Well, certainly, um, for the gospel to spread over the earth, you needed to have people with a little bit more free time on their hands. And um, although certainly these people who lived through the Industrial Revolution didn't enjoy that, the, the, those of us who benefited from, from it later on do enjoy it a lot more free time, and, and that allows us to learn and to share the gospel. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, when I went to South Korea, my mission, I, I stepped on a plane. I flew across the world uh, to South Korea, you know, and when I got, got out, you know, there was the mission president uh, with the car to, to bring me back, and sitting, um, uh, you know, in, in that room with the president was a box full of books of Mormon uh, that had been mass-produced, Right, uh, using machines so that we could spread the word, um, spread the gospel um, faster. Uh, you know, production up, cost down. I mean, this has been a great thing for missionary work. Certainly, we think about general conference broadcast via satellite, uh, the internet. I mean, around the world, uh, you know, um, live streaming. You know, um, it's amazing. In real time, we can hear the voice of a prophet of God in Africa, in Asia, in South America, in North America. Uh, this is just unheard of, um, and this starts with the Industrial Revolution. So, I mean, wonderful, wonderful things for the gospel, moving forth the cause of truth um, as the stone cut out of the mountain without hands rolls forth through the whole earth to fill the whole earth. This is part of it. Well, um, now some of you I saw did the quiz, well, maybe two of you, uh, and then some of you didn't, weren't able to, didn't, didn't do it. Uh, and so I wanted to at least look at some of these together because, of course, right, part of this record, right, you, you know, you read, you think about it, you know, you relate it, and then, you know, you try to say, okay, you know, where am I at uh, with this? We need to know that, of course, industrialization, right, okay, it increased production, it decreased costs, uh, it led to unemployment. Uh, as machines replaced men, even though later it would add to some different types of jobs, but certainly at first, right, because we're talking about the early Industrial Revolution. Also, it prolonged slavery in the United States. How do you think it prolonged slavery in the United States? Well, I was just asking myself the same question as I read that. Is it because of the invention of the cotton gin and they were making so much money? Well, de definitely. It's all related. So if you think about it, Britain industrialized first. Uh, they had these huge textile mills that just commanded the world of cloth making. Um, but to get the cloth made for the sweaters and the pants and whatever else they were going to make, right, you needed cotton. Well, Britain couldn't produce much cotton, but the U.S. could. And so 60% of all slave labor in the United States from 1800 to 1850, right, it was to produce cotton that was then exported to Great Britain for its textile mills, these industrialized factories. Uh, and so certainly, uh, just at a time where slavery, right, remember it was the slave trade ended 1808, okay, just at a time where it looked like it might be petering out, or at least starting to, suddenly the South sees this great advantage in cotton being king um, because of Britain's industrialization and then the U.S.'s own industrialization. And so we see slavery prolonged just as, as a side result uh, of this. Uh, also, now let's look at these. These effects on the family are mind-boggling. Talk about shifting life. Um, families, because of the Industrial Revolution, um, spent less time working together. Um, for example, you know, you're all on the family farm. You know, dad and the sons have certain jobs. Mom and the daughters have certain jobs. But yet, 
you're home for meals together, you know, you work together shoulder to shoulder, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now you start to see children going away, fathers going away, daughters going away, mothers staying home, right, these separate spheres. Work means dad goes away and then comes home at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock or whatever at night. That's the life that my children know. They know that daddy goes away and then he comes home. Right? This started in earnest right, from the Industrial Revolution. Um, well, earning money, of course, then becomes something done primarily away from home. Children who were forced to work to support their families had less parental influence in their lives, and so we start to see uh, the culture um, changing. We start to see morals changing um, in, a, in a big way. Uh, parents are, are worried about the chastity of their teenage daughters who, are, who uh, if the family is poor, have to go work in factories with single men. This was a very scary thing. Uh, mothers worried about not being able to pass on homemaking skills uh, to their daughters because they were away at factories rather than learning these time-honored arts of how to make a home. Uh, women and children became increasingly worried about their husbands or fathers becoming sick and unable to provide for families because Right? These jobs that were bringing in most of the money were done by the males who would go away and bring in the lion's share. Of course, you know, child labor would bring in something, but not nearly as much as uh, uh, what an adult man could bring in in, the, in this system. Uh, and if they got sick, watch out, because suddenly we have uh, mothers and children. Everybody has to go to work if dad can't work. Uh, and so we start to see huge changes in the family structure. Well, child labor, of course, you know, you read about just the... The, the terrible conditions, you know, 14 to 16 hour days, could be longer, uh, you know, ill treatment, being strapped if you're late, et cetera, et cetera, uh, dangerous conditions, um, you know, the loss of limbs and uh, fingers, et cetera, from these terrible machines um, that children could, do, could, could work because their fingers were so small. Uh, hard labor uh, for children, many of them talking about how they worked until they were exhausted. Uh, unhealthy conditions, uh, breathing in, unhealthy air, uh, no, uh, not uh, sufficient amount of breaks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and certainly they didn't have the long lunch breaks to go home and receive religious and moral education from parents. We start to see, right, this great cutting away of families uh, into these compartments of home life and then the work life. Um, well, Mill Girls and Lowell give another example uh, from the reading. Uh, you know, they did, they did all of these things. They were usually between 16 and 25. Uh, at work from 5 a.m. to 7 should be p.m., excuse me, uh, with 30 minutes for breakfast and 30 minutes for dinner. Uh, usually at work between 8 and 10 months of the year. Uh, they were usually very generous and self-sacrificing, as they often chose to send back every cent they earned to support their families. Now, they didn't have to do that, but many of them did. Uh, they were money earning. This is for the first time. Now we have women who, in a large proportion of their sector of the population, are money earning and potentially money spending members of the community who work outside the home. Women start becoming more like men. They're given the rare opportunities to speak in public um, about labor issues because their lives are tied up and they know best about what's going on in factories, and so they're given a voice in the public square. So all of these are big changes. Well, uh, if you think about this then, of course, right, we look at these scriptures. Right, which one stands out to you as being a lesson from the early Industrial Revolution? It was the one in Jacob about uh, taking care of the poor and the needy voluntarily. Sure. Definitely, right? Think of it. At a time when so many people are making so much money, it was so easy to let the natural man's selfishness and greed right, push all other thoughts of other people's welfare out of the way. And so it becomes harder to live your religion, so to speak. Uh, and so, of course, from Jacob 2, 17 through 21, um, we learned that, you know, uh, before we seek for riches, we should seek for the kingdom of God. Uh, and once, okay, we seek for the kingdom of God, and if we then obtain riches, we should use them to do good, right, to help people who are less fortunate uh, than we are. Of course, always remembering that, right, we are all precious unto God. Uh, and so we need not forget our neighbors who are less fortunate than us if we happen to be beneficiaries of an industrial society. Um, and so once again, I'm not knocking the industrial society, but we are saying that we have to remember to be Christ-like um, or else it doesn't work very well. Well, of course, from what we've been talking about, you can see that this really was another example of a tale of two cities. 
uh, Dickens' immortal work. Who would like to read this? This quote for us. I will, because I just read the book. I'll see if oh, I can great. do it in a really meaningful way. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. How do you say that word? Incredulity. Oh, okay. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven, we were all going the other way. Thanks so much. And of course, right, this is uh, 1775, looking at the world just before the French Revolution, looking at the American Revolution, but at the same time, certainly it can apply to the Industrial Revolution. How could this quote relate to the Industrial Revolution? What do you think? All these wonderful well, things were happening, but at the same time, yeah. a lot of terrible things were happening. So it's kind of that, that conflict there to move forward in this. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. And, and who was, I think someone else was starting to speak, too. Well, yeah, I was just thinking exactly what Christina had said before. Uh, and, and from some of the reading I did in this other history book you gave me, I don't think any of us would want to go back to what it was like before. And so every time we go through these periods, like um, Wendy said, these paradigms shifts, it's really difficult, and yet we wouldn't want to go back to what it was before. Hmm. Um, I was also thinking of how... Um, you know, there's it's, it, in this in this quote from the book, it talks about there's a lot of positive and a lot of negative. Um, and we talked about how it had effects on the family and how um, there was there wasn't as much time at home, yet it was building up to a time of of a lot of prosperity. Um, but when we study, you know, the the pride cycle in the Book of Mormon or or the Tyler cycle, we know that a lot of abundance leads to um, pride and then bondage again and I think maybe part of that is because when we're too focused on becoming abundant maybe um, you know in this, in this situation we forget about you know our morals and our families and everything um, yeah. when our focus is not on on that when it's when it's on you know abundance and so that's just a thought. Yeah that's a, that's a great thought Caden thank you so much for that you know and I mean think of it you know we like Peter will think any time we take our eyes off the Savior, right? When he looked and he saw the wind boisterous, he had taken his eyes off the Savior and he sank instead of being able to walk on water uh, like, like the Savior. Uh, and truly, that's something that we need to, to remember. Well, of course, right? Let's look at the best of times as well as the worst of times. Uh, so best of times, here are some uh, five revolutionary innovations of the early Industrial Revolution. I mean, lots of exciting things going on, so let, let's, you know, let's look at them here. Mass production through the, the division of labor, and we'll look at all these uh, in, in the detail in just a moment. Um, new machines and mechanization uh, of uh, processes. Uh, great increase in the supply of iron. Steam-powered engines and the changes they made in industry and transportation. Uh, and the electric telegraph that would start a revolution in communication. So if we look at the mass production then and division of labor, how would you, in your own words, reason uh, what this is? What's mass production? What's the division of labor? What does that look like? We kind of said it before how um, before one person would make, say, an entire chair. Um, but with the division of labor, maybe one person is working on the legs while someone else does the arm rests and someone else does the seat. And it kind of, you divide into doing one task rather than the whole thing, and that speeds it up. Yeah, great. Definitely. And so that's certainly the division of labor part of it. Uh, and what about the mass production? Where does that come from? Because, for example, I mean, if, if five of my friends stood in the line and made different parts of a chair, I mean, that would speed it up, but that wouldn't necessarily create mass production yet. Where does that come from? You're talking factories? Yeah, factories, right? Because, right, we start to see people as really overseers of machines. Right? People push buttons. People make sure the machine doesn't get stuck. If it gets stuck, you know, you reset it, and then it goes on its way again. Uh, and so certainly, if we look at this, mass production, there's a picture of Josiah Wedgwood. I'm not sure if any of you have a Wedgwood pottery, a Wedgwood plates at home. I know what my, uh, my folks do, my parents. Uh, so mass production, so the making of many identical items by breaking the process into simple repetitive tasks, uh, just as Christina said, uh, division of labor. And so in 1759, this is when this really starts in earnest. Once again, this is starting in Britain. We'll talk about why in a later slideshow. Um, but 
Uh, Staffordshire, England, he established a factory to mass produce pottery through this division of labor. Uh, production increased, mass quality increased, um, so meaning you could make a lot of things at a pretty decent uh, quality, uh, and costs decreased. Well, mechanization then, how would you explain this in your own words? Because this is all part of it, of course. Um, maybe using uh, machines to, uh, uh, to do those uh, steps, the, uh, the, the small part, the, like, like using a machine to make the legs of the chair instead of having someone, uh, someone uh, sit there and hammer nails in all day. Yeah, excellent. That's a great comment, Walter. Thank you so much. Love to hear from you. Um, here we see mechanization, right, the use of machines, just as Walter said, to do the work previously done by hand. Beginning in the 1760s, we see a series of inventions that revolutionize the spinning of cotton. And then from textile production, we see it branching out to all aspects of what we call modern industry. Uh, we have all these machines with different uh, kind of funny names. We have the spinning jenny, 1764, which drew out cotton fibers and twisted them into thread. So now a thread can be made very easily. We have a water frame from 68, produced thread strong enough to be used without linen. So now we start to see costs going down, um, process being streamlined. Uh, the mule, which was not uh, a relation to a horse, this is 1785, it produced a stronger and finer thread. And so because of these three things, Britain starts to undersell in a big way the high-quality handmade cotton cloth from India, which, were, uh, which is where cotton was so abundant uh, and where this, this cloth uh, had, its, had its start. Uh, the power loom replaced hand loom weaving uh, in 84, improved in 15. Uh, this is just an example. I mean, think of it. You know, we're not talking about a computer. We're not talking about you know a great uh, shoe making factory as we would see it in 2000 or what is this? 2010. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a machine. This is what you'd see in factories back at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But nonetheless, it improved uh, lots of things. Okay. So, what do you think about iron production? Now, this one I don't expect you to know, but do you have any guesses as to why iron production might increase? Um, this is just a total guess, but maybe all the people who were out of work um, got jobs at the mines. I don't know. Well, that, you know, that's a great guess. And, and, and true, this is, this, is the, this is the most difficult one. But that's an excellent guess because there were so many people who, you know, when a machine can do the work of 200 men, well, you need one person to push the button and 199 people are out of work. Definitely, as Wendy said. Uh, if we look at the reasons, they're slightly different. Uh, but 1709, coke, uh, which is coal from which the impurities had been cooked out, um, was used instead of charcoal. And because of this great innovation, iron is so much cheaper to produce. Um, because, of course, in England, we see coal being very, very plentiful. And so lots and lots of iron is produced. Uh, 1784, coke is improved. And so now you start to see iron that is even stronger. Uh, so just uh, as an example, 1740, 17,000 tons of iron were produced in Britain. But by 1844, 3 million tons. Uh, and that was as much as the rest of the world put together, just in Britain. Um, because of that, by 1851, you start to see these grand displays of Britain's industrialization, such as the Crystal Palace, which was made entirely from iron and then glass, of course, um, to showcase this new superabundance of iron. Uh, anybody seen the Crystal Palace? I haven't seen it either, so that's okay. But at least that, that's, that's in the picture. Um, well, steam, what do you think the importance of steam was to the Industrial Revolution? What was um, your like reason? the steamboat, I guess. Yeah, definitely. The, steam, the steamboat came from it. <laughs> but what was it, what was it about? You know, you're, you're on the right track. But why was steam used to power a boat? I mean, why not just row it? There wasn't or use the wind. No gasoline, then. What was that? That was before gasoline, so they used steam instead. Mm. Sure. Well, why and and why, why do we use gas today and steam then? I mean, what, what's the benefit? Basically, you can usually go faster and farther by using a different force other than just human force. Sure. It's right, because it's so much stronger, right, um, as a source of power. Well, it's a mechanical substitute, just as you're saying, right, for animal or human power. Thomas Newcomen developed the first practical steam engine, but it was 
much too costly, and so it sort of fell out of favor. But in 1769, James Watt, and the last name might seem familiar to you, uh, the Watt uh, comes from his name. Um, then uh, in 1769, he came up with a pattern, and then he teamed in 1785 with a business partner, Matthew Bolton, to create the most celebrated invention of the entire 18th century. It is the Watt Improved Steam Engine. Uh, and this steam engine would revolutionize industry because his steam engine led to river steamboats uh, by 1783, ocean steamboats, 1838, steam locomotives, right, the choo-choo train, okay, 1825, right, uh, and these things all lead to widespread industrialization. With these means of transportation, industrialization spreads, right, across the Western world, uh, in Europe, over to the United States, uh, as well as we start to see with industrialized, uh, with an industrialized nation, the United States starts to spread to the West. So where all of us are living right now, right, we can thank, you know, steam locomotives in part for bringing us here um, to go way back. Well, just some pictures, of course. You know, we start to see this new urban landscape, uh, one of the first steam engines, the bottom left. Uh, we see the golden triangle of early industrialization in Europe. Uh, we see here Berlin to Paris to London, of course, it all starting in, in the L London and Manchester and England, and then diffusing south and then to the east and to the west. Uh, etc. throughout Europe and then eventually going over to the United States. Okay, what about the telegraph? What do you think the importance of the telegraph was uh, in the Industrial Revolution? It's important to be able to communicate um, shipments, various shipments or, or whatever. Communication is the key to have yeah. things run well. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Lori. I mean, uh, you know, I, I use email all the time in my job um, you know, and I know that business people, because I, you know, I, I uh, know a lot of them, you know, as, as friends, uh, you know, but they're constantly, they're on their, their Blackberry, you know, they're uh, on the, their laptop, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right, trying to get the latest figures, uh, perhaps from the stock market, uh, trying to, you know, buy and sell, to trade, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right, this is the start of this great uh, revolution in communication with the electric telegraph. Uh, of course, it's a device for rapid, long-distance transmission of information over an electric wire. Right? We still have electric wires with us today. Just look outside your window. There's probably a telephone pole somewhere. Um, 1800, if we, if we look at how this process came about, Alessandro Volta in Italy, uh, the name Volt that we know today comes from his last name, he invented a battery, and this was the start. Uh, by 1837, we have Wheatstone uh, and Cook in England, and then Samuel Morse in the United States. Uh, inventing the first practical telegraphy systems. Uh, 1840s, we see this boom in telegraphy uh, in the U.S. and in Western Europe. Uh, 1851, the first submarine telegraph cable, it went under the English Channel, um, was put in place. And so we start to see a shrinking world, right? Uh, the world at our fingertips. Um, and, of course, this is with us today. Um, I'm, I'm sure we all have friends from around the country from around uh, the world, and we, we stay in contact through these great advances in communication. Uh, so if we, if we were to look then specifically and relate, how do you, um, how do the, fi the big five innovations of the early Industrial Revolution relate to your life today, and how do they relate to the plan of salvation? Well, as far as relating to our life today, uh, my daughter Sophie just had to do a report on Samuel Morse, and maybe everybody already knows this, but I probably learned it and forgot. But the reason he was so interested in learning this method of communication was because his wife got very, very ill, and she died, and he wasn't able to get to her side in time. And so he wanted to come up with a way that nobody else would have to go through that same problem, that they would be able to communicate with their loved ones and be able to get to them in time of emergency. And so that's something we have today. We know immediately when something's going right or wrong, or, or we just need to talk to people. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for that rich detail, Heidi. That was great. What else do we think? Well, certainly, uh, if we think of modern life, uh, it would be hard to have life as we know it uh, without any one of these five uh, big innovations of the early Industrial Revolution. I mean, truly, just look around you. 
look around you and start to list, uh, you know, do it with your family tonight if you want. Start to list all of the things that come from an industrialized world. Uh, it is just amazing to, to see, um, wow, I mean, I'm just inserted into this, into this changed world. Uh, and certainly, so many of these things help move forward the cause uh, of the gospel, as we said before, and, and uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, well, if, if we then look, of course, just um, to end, you know, there were, you know, it was the worst of times, too, in some Hello? ways. And some of these. Oh, go Can ahead. Can hear me? Hello? Hi, Wendy. Hello, Wendy. Uh, Wendy, are, are you on mute? Um, well, this is a great example of uh, relying too much on uh, the Industrial Revolution and technology. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't always work. Um, Hello? Wendy, oh, there you are. Um, did, 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 did something happen? Hello? Well, since she, she did, I think she's having a hard time hearing, too. Yeah. yeah. She just typed that she can't hear very well. Yeah. No, I see that. Is anyone besides me unable to hear all of a sudden? Um, I wonder Wendy, she, can you hear me now? Sometimes you need to make sure your um, little things are pushed all the way into the computer as they come out. Hmm. But your, you can hear phones. me now, right? Uh, I don't know. Can, if she can you hear my voice? Hello? I think the rest of us can. I think Wendy's just having a hard time. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay, I'm, I'm very sorry, Wendy. This, this uh, I mean, it truly does illustrate, though, uh, one of the, the negative effects um, of industrialization. Um, okay, uh, we do hope you can come back uh, with us, Wendy, though. Well, if, if we look, then, in our, in our final, you know, uh, five or so minutes, certainly, um, you know, there are some negative effects of industrialization. You know, what, what do we see here? Now, this one perhaps isn't too grievous, but... but could be negative for sure. What's the effect? I think I'd definitely rather have a handcrafted horse than a little like, plastic mold thingy that's one of a million. Sure. So just we lose that for sure. Yeah, right. I mean, how much culture is lost, right, as you move to a horse that has a rod, a plastic rod, sticking through its belly so it can stand up, right? I mean, horses don't look... Right? You know? Um, but yet, because of because we're trying to make them all alike, right, in these molds, well, they all have a little stand, and the stand connects to their belly. So we start to have children growing up thinking that horses are born with stands. Right? Mr. Gentile? Um, okay. Mr. Gentile? Yes. I would, I would add also that, that uh, we become a, a cult culture of things. Mm -hmm. If things do not take a lot to make, you know, like all of the junk that comes from China, all of just the little trinkets and, and junk, really. Right. It's just junk. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you have made something, it has more inherent value. Yeah. Definitely right. And certainly, think. Think of the lessons you can learn if you spend 40 hours creating this horse on the left, right, versus... If you happen to go to the store and buy a 50 cent bag of toy horses for somebody's birthday, right? Um, you know, I think it's, it's very interesting uh, as, as we see. Because truly, in many ways, industrialization has created a materialistic throwaway culture, right? The paper plate is the great symbol of our culture in so many ways, at least the sad aspects of it, right? We throw everything away. And as Things mean less to us because we have to do less to get them. So do other things. They, in our minds, become disposable as well, such as marriages. We see this great marriage epidemic. Marriage becomes like a paper plate. People think, oh, you buy it, you know, you use it, and you throw it away, and you get a new one, right? What a terrible mindset that this uh, is partially responsible for. Okay, certainly uh, we see pollution. Uh, and of course, right, the earth was created to be used by man. But, as we'll see, a need to be wise stewards. And so certainly uh, we see some negative effects in changing the land uh, and polluting many of the beauties of God's earth and God's creations. Uh, child labor, 
but we've talked about, of course, um, the horrors of it, as well as what it did to the family structure. Um, we start to see, as Wendy pointed out, a huge divide between the wealthy and the is that when people don't try to pull the natural man, right, we see people forgotten, right? And because people don't choose, right, to be Christ-like uh, and live the gospel by helping when they can help, right, we start to see all of these ills um, in the world. Also, so many wars, we'll talk about imperialism, uh, pitting industrialized nations versus non-industrialized nations. And so, truly, industrialization becomes uh, the great uh, the great balance um, that, is, that uh, nations try to play. Uh, of course, negative effects, right? People use wonderful inventions for the wrong purposes, right? And when passions are unbridled, we see horrific acts that are done with machines, that are done because of industrialization, um, and their poor choices, like, like these. Uh, now, of course, um, we don't have to choose these, these, uh, these paths, but people do, uh, and it wouldn't have been possible without industrialization. So we do have to think uh, you know, of this two-edged sword and using this great gift wisely. Uh, let's look at this here, because, of course, God weeps when he sees us using great gifts, uh, like industrialization, right, to... Um, take advantage of his children. And it came to pass that the God of heaven looked, up, looked upon the residue of the people, and he wept. And Enoch bore record of it, saying, How is it that the heavens weep and shed forth their tears as the rain upon the mountains? And Enoch said unto the Lord, How is it that thou canst weep, seeing that thou art holy, and from all eternity to all eternity? And were it possible that man could number the particles of the earth? Yea, millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creations. And thy curtains are stretched out still, and yet thou art there, and thy bosom is there, and also thou art just, thou art merciful and kind forever. And thou hast taken Zion to thine own bosom, from all thy creations, from all eternity to all eternity, and naught but peace, justice, and truth is the habitation of thy throne. And mercy shall go before thy face and have no end. How is it that thou canst weep? The Lord said unto Enoch, Behold these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands, and I gave unto them their knowledge in the day I created them. And in the garden of Eden gave I unto man his agency, and unto thy brethren have I said, and also given commandment that they should love one another, and that they should choose me, their father. But behold, they are without affection, and they hate their own blood. Of course, right? It's a great, great um, lesson to be learned here about how when we choose any other way than Christ and God, that bad things happen to God's children. Things that he doesn't want to happen, but that happen because of poor choices. Uh, of course, right, with industrialization, for unto whom much is given, much is required, and he who sins against the greater light shall receive the greater condemnation. We need to be a wise steward over God's bounteous gifts. Uh, of course, if we look here, the Great Council from Doctrine and Covenants 59, 16 through 21, talks about how the earth is for us, right? All of these wonderful things are for the benefit and the use of man, both to please the eye and gladden the heart, yea, for food and raiment, for taste and for smell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man. For unto this end were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things, and obey not his commandments. Right? And certainly that would include being a wise steward over what he has given us. Well, uh, we've, come, we've brought this one up before, but truly we need to ask ourselves, um, are we seeking riches? Are we seeking the kingdom of God? What comes first? And if we have been blessed with riches, what are we doing with them? Uh, and riches could just mean more than we need. What are we doing with our excess? Um, are we using it to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to liberate the captive, and administer relief to the sick and afflicted, etc., etc.? Are we choosing to use our advantages to help other people, or are we being greedy and self-centered? Certainly, um, God weeps when we choose to be greedy and self-centered, and we, when we use great gifts like the Industrial Revolution, 
uh, to take advantage of other people. Uh, and of course, uh, when the people stop being good Christians and taking care voluntarily of their brothers and sisters, then we start to see people in the world saying, well, wait a minute, if people won't do it themselves, how else can we try to solve this problem? And that's when we see a host of other problems that arise from professed solutions. Um, well, I, uh, I'm grateful to, uh, to talk about these things with you. Uh, this, uh, I think, is, is an exciting unit um, because it has so many lessons for us. There's so much good, there's so much to watch out for, uh, and of course, there's so much to be grateful for. Um, I am grateful for God's gifts, and, and I pray that I can be a better steward over what I've been given um, in, uh, in this industrialized world. Uh, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Mr. Gentile. You're very welcome. I look forward to seeing everybody on Tuesday. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye.